Now, I'm going to finish everything today, actually, because um, this subject could go on 10 more lessons. I don't think that it would be a good idea to go 10 more lessons on this. So what I'm going to do is finish everything today, but I'll try to finish it as quickly as I can, also in a way where every one of you can understand. Okay, so first, first a lot of people, when they try to argue about how our universe is created, we mention that there's no other way around it except a transcendent intelligent mind that created it. Transcendent, transcends all this, who's outside of this place. One that is so powerful and one that has an intelligent mind. That's the only way that this can be done. And that is proven by inference to the best explanation. So there's no other way around it. People argue, well, gravity is what created everything. No, you cannot argue that because the reason why is within this singularity, remember, there's no space. If there's no space, then that means there's no energy, no matter, no nothing. Nothing means nothing. So that's a major problem. So you have to say something or someone is outside of this that has an intelligent mind and who's all power to put it into there. So you might as well call it God. Until they mention about quantum mechanics. Okay, so what is that? Quantum mechanics, the idea is it's, it's outside of this. It's outside of space, time, and everything. Because what you can do with gravity it's just made smaller than that's the idea. So they quantitize it or quantize it, however word he So in other words, make it smaller and smaller. That way we can have a materialistic explanation of the universe because we certainly don't want to say God. So in quantum mechanics, it is very interesting, but I'm not going to get into that. But basically, here are these quanta particles. And then they argue, and then some of these dumb atheists, they'll say, well, you're arguing for classical gravity. That's not the same as quantum gravity. Well, here's the funny thing is that, one, I'm aware, but two, I guess they uh, don't read their uh, articles. But notice right here, the physicist who's challenging the quantum orthodoxy for decades and space-time are fundamentally, fundamentally classical. So notice right here, this is from a quantum magazine itself. So they're saying you can't distinguish from classical gravity from quantum gravity. Well, what if, what if they're actually classical? Because you're struggling to develop a quantum theory of gravity. And to be honest, scientists are struggling to do that. And say, why is that? Because how do you end There are some things that they can prove, but when you get into the world of quanta, it's so difficult. The reason why is you're bound, you're stuck in this universe. Quanta is something that goes behind it. It's just so out there. So how are you going to argue? How are you going to prove your points? But anyways, let's assume, and we are going to go by their proofs on how these Quantum particles, let's call it, quantum particles, how they're able to have quantum gravity, how they're able to have maybe quantum energy, quantum matter, or whatever quantum thing they want to put in there. The point is that in the quantum realm, that's their excuse to create everything in this universe, and it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be basically purely they like to call this nothing, but they want to say within the nothing, there is nothing still. That's what they want to argue. Because the reason why is they want to argue God. So then they have to argue quantum particles. So this is eternal, and because it's eternal, these quantum particles can create everything in our universe eventually, given enough time. Now, we're going to debunk several things. 
with this theory of quantum mechanics. First of all, even if it's uh, forever, the point is the problem with quantum mechanics and quantum cosmology. So cosmology is the study of the universe, OK? Just back and forth with those two words. Let's even assume within quantum mechanics that the quanta state or the quanta realm, it's always been around. The problem is when I study the scientists is that they don't explain those so-called eternal things, how those things exactly caused the Big Bang or caused the universe to happen. That's a huge problem with them. So what was quanta doing? Just sitting there for all eternity then? You got to explain to me what caused it to happen. So here's an example. Like angels are eternal, right? So even though angels are eternal, that doesn't mean that they created our universe. Another example, hell is eternal, right? But that doesn't mean hell created our universe. Our souls, they're eternal. That doesn't mean that our souls created the whole universe. So just because you can argue something was eternally there before the universe, that doesn't mean it created the universe. You have to explain it, how it caused it. For example, if you're in an island, okay, you see a nice mansion and you see a statue. I don't care if the statue is eternal. You're not going to assume that statue created that mansion. If you're stuck in the middle of an island and then there's a statue here that's for all eternity and then there's a mansion over there, you're not going to say that statue created that mansion, just even though it has an eternal lifespan. No one would. So you have to realize unless you show what actually caused it or somehow that inanimate object or that material, like a statue, caused that mansion to be created, then I'll believe it. But if you can't explain it, then how am I going to believe it? That's the problem with the quantum mechanics explanation is that they don't explain to you the exact cause. They just, shows, they just show you that it can be before the universe and it can always be there. That's pretty much it. Now, there are some arguments that they do give to explain what caused our universe. And then so here are the following options that they give. In the following options that they give, they give what is called the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, if I'm pronouncing that correctly. But the uh, Wheeler-DeWitt equation, that one is something from Stephen Hawking. Now, that's the reason why he was able to give a famous statement that we don't need God. That's why he gave some statements that the universe uh, doesn't have to be bound by time or by a beginning. That's why he was able to argue about gravity creating our universe. Why? Because he was able to use the Wheeler-DeWitt equation and the universal uh, wave function from quantum qu cosmology to explain the creation or to uh, explain how our univer universe was formed. Then there are other arguments given. They mention about mathematics. So they always use equations, and you're going to see these people, how they're going to measure the positive and negative energy from the beginning of the universe with the negative energy from gravity, and then blah, 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 blah. And that's what created the Big Bang, blah, 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 eventually. So they're going to use equations. But they're not going, what you're not going to hear is clearly what caused it to happen. All they're using is numbers to show that it is possible that the universe can be formed that way. No, you have to ask them what material caused it. How did the material cause it? You have to interrogate them on that. Don't let numbers uh, fool you away and you get scared, all right? Don't let them say negative one and positive one equals zero. So zero, it can create something. Don't let that fool you, okay? Say, no, 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 don't give me numbers. Tell me what material is it, and how did the material exactly do that, all right? You'll notice what they're going to explain, how those materials or quantum particles created our universe. They're always going to use mathematical numbers to explain what caused it. 
No, I want specific scientific actions, okay? Not numbers to explain the action. They always hide it through jargon, okay? But anyways, uh, I'll, I'll debunk that mathematics argument, okay? That they'll also say quantum tunneling, and then they'll say inflationary cosmology. Call that in our previous, previous lesson. lesson. It's random fluctuations or quantum fluctuations throughout our universe that can uh, create bubble universes. And then they mention string theory. So these are all their things that they're going to use within quantum cosmology to prove or to explain what caused our universe. Now these are all going to be debunked, okay? How you can debunk all of them is as follows. One is that they presuppose a universe or they presuppose a singularity to come up with those causes that they use. All right, so you know what presupposes, obviously. It's to accept that something is true before it has been proved. <laughs> so remember that. So there is no proof of it. All they're going to do is presuppose. In other words, they're just going to accept something is true without proving it. Without proving it. So if you look at uh, this picture here, this is how Stephen Hawking did the Wheeler-DeWitt equation. Okay? So here are possible universes that can come out. These possible universes can come out from, this is the universal wave function. Now this little symbol is going to be very important. Okay? Basically because of this symbol, from mathematical equations that they use, that's the reason why this universe can come out. See that? All right, so this is the uh, universal wave function. Now, how did our universe get formed? Or any other possible universe can form? Because of this guy. But notice before this guy, here's what they have different other universes here. And they come from this singularity. Okay, so this point right here is a singularity. Remember the singularity? That's the nothing, right? that our universe came from. But notice what's before the nothing. This other stuff. This other universes, and then also another singularity. In other words, you still go back to a singularity. So he didn't prove, the point is this, he did not prove He didn't prove we came from nothing. He had to presuppose a singularity already. So he had to make up a singularity in his figment of his imagination, in his assumption, so that he can prove that the universe he came from nothing. He didn't prove it came from nothing. He imagined a singularity. He put the singularity there so that he can create the universe and then have another singularity to create all the other possible universes, etc. To have his uh, universal wave function operate. But here's another issue is uh, with quantum tunneling, that's probably the most common thing that they use to prove that the universe was created through the power of quantum. But another problem to this is that they presuppose a universe. <laughs> so let me show you that one. So this is on the return of the God hypothesis, page 376. So the debunking to this, so let's explain, in his quantum cosmology model, the Lincoln proposes quantum tunneling to explain how the universe developed from an initial singularity to an expanding universe with our gravitational field. He first posits the existence of a universe beginning in a singularity. As soon as this universe begins to expand, by what mechanism the Lenkin does not say, its continued expansion would, according to Einstein's field equations, be opposed by an increasing gravitational energy barrier resulting from a matter field that the Lenkin assumes would be present in that expanding space. 
but that energy barrier would fur make further expansion impossible and push the universe back to a singularity. In ordinary quantum mechanics, there is a greater than zero probability of a particle escaping a high wall enclosure functioning as a potential energy barrier. In a similar way, Belenkin's tunneling wave function suggests the possibility that the initial universe that emerges out of the singularity could overcome the gravitational energy barrier, thus allowing it to grow large enough to continue to expand. In any case, okay, so that tunneling, right? You notice that right there? Notice right here, it all began with as soon as this universe begins to expand. By what mechanism, Vilenkin does not say. See that? So because of this, he needs that universe there. He has to presuppose the universe. He has to imagine a universe to find that quantum tunneling function to work. So that's not coming from nothing. See that? He has to put a universe in there. He has to presuppose. In other words, again, he has to assume that it is there without proving it. <laughs> so he had to imagine, make up that universe for him to come up with this quantum tunneling function. He didn't get it out of nothing again. You have to remember, you have to go to prove uh, that it came from nothing. You can't presuppose a singularity or a universe in there, okay? Now let's go to number two. The problem is math is meaningless without an intelligent mind. So even though they come up with these calculations, all right, here's the problem here. If you look at this guy, it means nothing to you. It's just a fork. It's just a little drawing. It's a picture. What makes this have meaning? You ever thought of that? What makes this have meaning? An intelligent mind that puts something into there. It represents something. It's supposed to picture something. It's supposed to function as something. This thing don't do anything. It's just a drawing. But it means something when you put your mind into it. So here's something right here. If I draw this, this doesn't mean anything to you. For all you know, I could just draw and that means, no uh, that means nothing until what? You put an intelligent mind there that puts meaning into it. This represents this. This has to function as this way, as follows. But it won't mean anything without an intelligent mind. See that? You can't say math is by itself. Math is meaningless without an intelligent mind. It, math means something when there's an intelligent mind to it. Listen, no matter how much you want to try to argue around it, you can't separate an intelligent mind from that number. That's how was math created, by the way, right? How was this number created, this drawing created? You have to have an intelligent mind in there. You can't separate that. So here's the funny thing, is that from these equations uh, that they came up with, you know what they had to do? What they had to do uh, from all of that is they had to put boundaries there. The, they had to restrict the equation. They can't just randomly come up with numbers, right? So what they had to do is put a lot of intelligence and they had to choose the right numbers. They had to select the equation, restrict them in a way where they can be able to come up with their calculations. Here's uh, going back to that presupposition thing that uh, Dr. Myers argued. We'll go back there. He mentions right here, as philosopher of physics Willem Dries notes, Hawking and Hartle interpreted their wave function of the universe as giving the probability for the universe to appear from nothing. However, this is not a correct interpretation since the normalization presupposes. See, that's their problem. 
It presupposes a universe, not nothing. And then this is from a uh, philosopher of physics. Another one right here. Let me erase this part. That way it's not confusing. In ordinary quantum mechanics, an experimental apparatus has to exist before physicists can determine the wave function that describes the probable behavior of the photon within that apparatus. It follows from the same analogy that justifies quantum cosmology in the first place, that a universe must first exist with possible properties before quantum cosmologists can construct the universal wave function. How about that? So then there's presupposition there. They have to put a universe in there first. The mathematics of quantum cosmology begins by describing a universe or universes already presupposed to exist. So we saw the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, right? You saw that drawing? You notice that they had to presuppose. They had to insert already a universe over there. Same thing with quantum tunneling. They had to do that, a universe or a singularity. You had to presuppose stuff. But then another issue lies within their mathematic arguments because notice right here, from the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, for example, that you have to put an intelligent mind. So again, it's all what? Intelligent design. It's intelligent design. When they put the math in there to prove how, uh, how the universe can be possibly created, that should make you admire God more. Right. <laughs> That's how brilliant he is. Right. Makes up all those equation, equations inside the heads and then can select the right numbers, restrict everything to the boundaries and the equations, and then come up with such a calculation, bam, like that. If you read this one, thus the choice to exclude a nearly infinite number of mathematical solutions to the Wheeler-DeWitt equation. Oh, a lot of people didn't know about that. You think that it's just some equation that can come out like that. No, actually, for the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, you can come up with infinite number of uh, mathematical solutions. But if you do that, that's not realistic in the science realm. I can't just pick any, uh, any solution or any number of a solution that I want to. That's not how real life works. So what they have to do, A, directly impose boundary conditions on the equation. You know what that is? Intelligent design, fine tune. Remember that? In the laws of physics, remember? In the laws of physics itself, those laws are made up of initial and boundary conditions. The laws of physics are fine-tuned themselves. <laughs> That's a problem. That's a problem. So then what, what put it in there, right? If it's fine-tuned that way. B, limiting the possible universes under consideration when constructing the universal wave function. Limiting pass through superspace. Look at that right there. So then they have to pick. They have to select. The Wheeler-DeWitt equation is not something that just came out of nothing. There's an intelligent mind in there. Both represents an enormous input of information. That's a lot of information. What does that translate to? Intelligence, mind, a very intelligent mind, <laughs> into the mathematical equations and procedures that quantum cosmologists use to model the origin and development of the universe. Halliwell notes of the Hawking-Hartle model, the wave function is therefore only fixed uniquely. See that? It's fine-tuned. After one has put in some extra information fixing the contour. Indeed, the source of that extra information is precisely what is at issue here. 
See, you have to, you can't separate an intelligent mind, no matter how much you argue around it. There's an intelligent mind even within the mathematical equations itself. Okay. Three. We already know this. Math doesn't cause things to happen. See this little thing? That ain't going to kill you. That ain't going to create you. It's just going to stick on that whiteboard. Remember the example that I gave concerning about, let's say that I preached a sermon, and then there were like 100 people, and then 50 just less left the room? Then what am, I, what am I going to do? Blame it on math? No. Just because I say 100 minus 50 must equal 50. So it has to be so. See, it has to be so no matter how you look your way around it. Because math is indisputable. That don't mean math caused it to happen. Math only describes the numbers there. See? So math don't cause things to happen. You have to find an actual scientific, materialistic cause, not a picture or a symbol or a number or a drawing, because it won't cause things to happen. See that? So remember, math don't cause things to happen. So then, there's, this is how they argue around it. No, math is just realistic. So because <clears throat> math is realistic, then they came up so here's the argument to debunk it, the mathematical universe hypothesis. So in other words, any possible mathematical solution out there, it must represent or, or it must be something real out there. Now you know why that is very laughable? That's not very intellectual to say. Nobody's, nobody with the same mind is going to believe in that. Because you saw earlier how the Wheeler-DeWitt equation, it can have an infinite number of possible solutions there. So picture this, okay? If you're going to argue that every single one of those solutions is supposed to be some real life scenario, picture how our world's going to be. You thought about that? You ever pictured what our universe will be? Picture how scientific laws will function according to any of those random number solutions out there. What, what, what do you picture in your mind? Chaos. Yeah. As a matter of fact, some of these athe atheist uh, physicists, they're, op they're open to that. It's so la-la land. They'll, they'll say that, here I have a cup of coffee right here, it's hot, but in the realm of quantum mechanics, it could be cold in some other timeline, or it could be floating in midair. The Statue of Liberty waving at you, scientifically impossible. But in quantum mechanics, anything is possible. You might as well argue that there are 50 unicorns of a pink rainbow out there. See, that's so ridiculous for the mathematical universe hypothesis. No one, no one sane is going to believe in that. So this is uh, promoted by Tegmark. So I will read uh, his... Uh, I will read Meyer's uh, explanation to this. Okay. He says right here, if Tegmark's theory, the mathematical universe hypothesis, every mathematical solution out there is something real. Well, aptly describes reality, anything... Oh, excuse me, I'm doing that again. All right. Anything can... He says right here, anything can and will happen somewhere in some universe infinitely many times. Every event or causal antecedent may presage an infinite number of possible consequent events in any one of an innumerable set of possible worlds, worlds governed by an innumerable set of possible mathematically described deterministic laws of physics. In addition, if eternal chaotic inflation aptly, uh, we'll forget that part. But basically, un unpredictable events all the time. Now, you know what the problem with that is? Then what that does, like the example I gave to you about the Statue of Liberty waving high at you, which is scientifically impossible, see that? It contradicts what? Science. 
Why? With math. That's how you can get around it. I thought they prized empirical science. Remember what empirical science is. It's our uniform experience. Everything through our five senses that we taste, feel, touch, and see everything. That's how we can judge things to be true. In quantum mechanics, you can't do that. So notice they put blind faith there. That's the yeah, cuckoo for Cocoa Puffs. <laughs> And they didn't even eat Cocoa Puffs. They just became cuckoo without Cocoa Puffs. Scientific explanation presupposes the uniformity and regularity of nature. That's what science is, right? Including the uniformity of the fundamental laws of physics and the regularity of patterns of cause and effect. What you see normally, regular patterns. But Tegmark's mathematical universe hypothesis implies that such uniformity and regularity may not characterize our universe. However much it might have seemed to do so up until this point, given Tegmark's infinite universe cosmology, scientists could attribute any particular event to a cause long known to produce that effect. No one lives that way. No one. No one lives that way. Everyone lives by uniform experience. You know why you feel like that it's safe to drive a car within 70 mile per hour on a, on a stinking freeway with a whole bunch of cars zooming past you? Because of your uniform experience. Because how that car is built based on uniform experience. Would you trust the car if it had a previous history of uniform experience of being faulty? You go buy empty gas. You're going to drive that car when you go on empty gas in the middle of a desert? No. Why? Because common sense dictates from uniform experience, this is stupid. I might die out here. I ain't going to drive a car on empty gas. But in quantum mechanics, you could suddenly have gas all of a sudden. So why, not, why don't all of you do that? See, they don't, I'll, you know, if we're going to be very honest, no one, not even an atheist, really has faith in quantum mechanics. Okay. That betrays their uniform experience. <laughs> so why do they believe in that? See that? They have to. Because supernatural stuff from God is too la-la land for them. So they take better chances with quantum mechanics. <laughs> Hilarious. You know, they're, uh, if they think that we're stupid for making up miracles. They're stupid themselves with their quantum mechanics. It demands such miracles, abnormalities to happen. Oh, my goodness. There's, see, professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. Yeah, they're so stupid, man. But anyway, yep, I lost everything. Good for me. Yep, I knew that would happen. All right. Now, the next one is the, another argument to debunk it is that it's fine-tuned. So they mention about quantum tunneling. They mention about string theory. They mention about mathematical equations. Remember, from what I told you before, is that the mathematical equations, they're all what? Fine-tuned. <laughs> so that's the problem. What about quantum tunneling that created our universe? What about inflationary cosmology, th string theory? Well, there's a problem with that because when we go back here, notice that in the first place, as we've seen, the fine-tuning of the what? Inflation. Fine-tuning of the inflation. That's what they explain our universe. Inflationary cosmology is what created our universe. It's fine-tuned. Shut off energies necessary to produce new habitable bubble universes. Okay, that's what inflation... Inflationary cosmology demands, right? You got to shut off, have shut off energies that would be enough to produce new habitable bubble universes. You know what the chances of that happening are? Ranges from between one part in 10 to the 53rd power and one part in 10 to the 123rd power. It's fine tuned to do that. Second, the fine-tuning associated with the choice of inflationary models and the various parameters specified in these models is one part in 10 to the what? 66 million power. You know what that is? I'd sooner take a chance Jesus raising the dead back to life than that one. Yeah. 
That's the odds and the that's the odds of it. This is so silly right there, man. Third, inflationary cosmology makes the already acute fine-tuning problem associated with the initial low entropy state of our universe exponentially worse. We call that low entropy corresponds to a highly ordered state and high entropy to a more disordered state. In a cosmological context, the initial low entropy state of the universe refers to an initial highly ordered homogeneous distribution of mass energy. So notice right here that everything is fine-tuned. Inflation, uh, the bottom part right here, inflationary cosmology not only does nothing to explain this in initial entropy fine-tuning, estimated by Roger Penrose at one part to 10, uh, one part in 10 to the 10th power and 123 after that one, if that makes any sense. I think actually, that, no, that's a footnote, excuse me. So that was a footnote. I made that mistake last time too, actually. Let me make sure that the other ones are not in footnotes here. Uh, they were pro no, this is correct and that's correct. Okay then, so those aren't footnotes, okay. But you see how ridiculous that thing is? So it's fine tuned, even string theory itself. So notice right here, uh, string theory also requires fine tuning of the universe generating mechanism. We call that string theorists assume uh, blah, 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 let's skip all that one down because uh, I don't have time here. Through, though, th though this process may, in theory, explore many of the possible universes with different sets of law and constants, it too requires exquisite prior fine-tuning. Recall that in string theory, just the solutions that produce universes with a positive cosmological constant represents 10 to the 500th power or possibly 10 to the 1,000th power. Fine-tune. Fine tune. That's a huge problem to them. So it, it demands, again, intelligent design. Again, that in turn implies a need for exquisite initial condition fine tuning as measured by the rarity of the highest energy solutions, roughly one part in 10 to the 500th power or more within the array of possible solutions or compactifications or universes. Even so, however, there is no guarantee that all the possible compactifications will get explored this way. String theorists have no way of knowing that this mechanism would explore every path down the mountain. That requirement implies a need for some unknown finely tuned mechanism or what? Directed process, that's a problem to ensure that exploring the landscape lands on one of the few extremely improbable life compatible, life compatible compactifications. That's a huge problem. If you left in, uh, the quantum tunneling, inflationary cosmology, string theory, and all those things by itself, you gotta realize this, if you really left it by itself, then it would have destroyed or it would have caused, um, it wouldn't evolve, it would cause more harm perhaps if you left things by itself, or nothing would happen. So that's the reason why it's such a small chance right there. It had to be directed. It had to be fine-tuned every step of the way. That's a huge problem right there. Another thing that uh, I want to cover is not just fine-tuning that debunks it, but also here's a goody, goody, all right? For some of you who didn't know about this, in quantum mechanics, they argue that this little symbol, right, the universal wave function, okay? So for some of you who kind of got lost and didn't know what I meant by the universal wave function, it's that little symbol guy, okay? You notice how I mentioned this quite a few times, right? This is important to them, that universal wave function for their equations. For this thing to be activated, you know how you activate this thing? Where you can get this. Here's the crazy thing, you ready for this? You know how you activate that thing to get this thing going? You need to observe it. Who was there to observe it? Oh! Oh, then you can argue that an intelligent person must have been there then. 
You can't escape God. Isn't that hilarious? See, even with their uh, wheeler DeWitt equation, you have to have observation for this to activate. So they don't want to say. They don't want to say someone was there to see it. All right, so you know what they'll say? It's some kind of large macroscopic object. That don't make things better, man. Who's a large macroscopic object that says, I fill up heaven and earth and all the universe itself? See, God. For this thing to activate, you need God. Wheeler DeWitt equation desperately needs God. Do you understand that? Otherwise, you can't activate this little guy. <laughs> wow, incredible, isn't it? Now, that's why they know that. They don't like that. So, what they do is this. It's just so funny, okay. They always have arguments around this. It doesn't necessarily have to be activated. It just is. So, in other words, we don't need anyone to observe it. It doesn't need to have an interaction with a large macroscopic object. It just is. So if it just is, the idea is this. So then let's say that uh, I see a huge mirror in front of me, okay? And I smash that mirror. If I smash that mirror, that mirror is going to reflect many different versions of me, right? So here's the real me, and then here's the mirror. The mirror is cracked, and then I see probably 10 different versions of me in that mirror. Do you know what I mean? Okay, from that example, that's what they're saying about the universal wave function. In other words, nothing has to cause or to activate it. It just is. It's like, here's the real me, and then here's like 10 different versions of me in the mirror. The mirror just is, all right? So I just see 10 different versions of me. So that's the way that they're going to argue it. So because they have to argue that, you know what that means? That's why they have to... Uh, believe in a multiverse. People who use quantum mechanics to prove that our, or to argue that our universe was created through this little guy, they have, you're going to see them quite often mention multiverse. Why? Because you have to say that. If I look at that mirror and then I'm going to see 10 different versions of me, you're going to have to say there's 10 possible universes out there. Here's another problem. You know what the huge problem is? The huge problem is within quantum mechanics, here's this quantum particle. You ready for this? If you argue it was there for eternity, you can't say that it was sitting down doing nothing for eternity. That doesn't make sense. What was quanta doing for eternity? Nothing. And then all of a sudden it starts operating and then our universe is created? No, if quanta never did, no, if quanta did nothing for eternity, that means it will do nothing for eternity. That doesn't make sense. I showed you that in our other discipleship class, right? About the primeval atom, how it was just, they argue, well, there was a primeval atom that was there for all eternity, sitting down and doing nothing. It didn't evolve for eternity. If it didn't evolve for eternity, it won't evolve at all. That's what it means, fool. See that? So, you see, you will notice right here, they can't say that. Quanta has to be constantly running then. That's why they argue multiverse. See that? Infinite amount of universes. You can't just sit down and do nothing. But the easy debunking to these arguments are as follows. Why is this multiverse easily debunked? One is, it doesn't change the fact that you cannot get rid of an intelligent mind for those equations. Remember that? So an intelligent mind is what made you come up with the equations for the multiverse. A second thing is because, oops, there is no empirical scientific evidence for the multiverse. There is, you can't, it's just theoretical. You have to make assumptions based on math. <laughs> so notice right here, they have no empirical scientific evidence for the multiverse, and that's from the Big Think article. They mentioned string theory was originally sold as a theory of everything that would give us a complete account of this explicit universe. 
we live in, when the string landscape with its 10 out of 500 power possible solutions, oh, they just emitted fine tuning right there, but they just glossed through it, right? Yeah. Okay. Its multiverse was discovered. It was for many an indication that the theory was not delivering on its promises. Things have only gotten worse for string theory since then. And the excitement it generated 20 or 30 years ago has long since waned. Inflationary cosmology does have some good empirical grounding and is now part of the standard account of the universe. Inflationary cosmology with their quantum tunneling and all that that I mentioned to you before, that's probably their best one. That's the best one that they could come up with. But I showed you the faults to that one. But inflation, inflation is really more of a class of theories than a single model. <laughs> and etern but here's the problem. When you make inflation eternal, that's a huge problem then, right? Represents more of a thorn on, in its side than a triumphant prediction. Many theorists would be happy to find a way to turn off all those other pocket universes if they could. After all, if your best theory to explain some gas cloud in the Andromeda galaxy demands the existence of 100 unobservable, see that? That's the problem. It's not observed. Then they put pink elephants around the star Vega. Your theory might have a problem. That was pretty mean to say. So put it all together, and it turns out that scientifically, the multiverse is mostly a bust. It is a solution to problems with existing theories, not an explanation for unexplained observations or data. They have nothing empirical, scientific to prove. That means, oh, look at this language. We are stuck with this one universe we see, that's scientific, empirical, observable, and the one history that allowed us to be here looking at it. And I still love the multiverse as fiction. Go Doctor Strange. Yeah, that's what your PhD scientists are. It's all just uh, sci-fi fantasy. Yeah, it's not realistic science. Yeah. That's the problem with the multiverse. Here's another problem with the multiverse. Another problem, yep, man, it's going to be erased. Here we go. Oh, thank God, it's not erased. Okay, so another problem with the multiverse is they're all subject. Here's the problem. No matter what cosmological model or universe model to explain how our universe was created, remember in our previous teaching, they're all subject to the uh, board guth vilenkin theorem. All of it, all cosmological models. I've shown that before in our discipleship class. Fresh reminder what that is. So two of these founders right here, okay, Guth and Vilenkin, they mention that I don't care how many multiverses you put in there, they're all subject to a beginning. That's the problem. So you can't go eternity of universes you're going to have to hit a beginning point. Okay. <laughs> it all has a beginning point. And how can you explain that beginning point, what created our universe? They have none. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's so funny. Bizarre. So they're, they're in denial right there. So it's all subject to the board guth vilenkin theorem. Now remember, Guth and Vilenkin, to be fair to them, they're not saying, that doesn't mean there, have to be, there has to be a beginning. You know why they say that, right? Because then they're going to get heat from their atheist, agnostic, scientific friends. But they pointed out right here that you're finding difficulty answering how we can override or overpass a beginning. There are no real good scientific explanations around it. They all, no matter what kind of answer, you go around this singularity, this beginning, and insist that this was going on for eternity, it's going to all bend toward right here again. The, the beginning, beginning, beginning. It can't go on eternity. That's a huge problem for them. Another one is the last one, which is pretty obvious is, OK, so let's say there are many multiverses there. Remember the fault to that argument is? Then it's going to be against empirical science of our uniform everyday experience. 
so it's against science not only is it unscientific to be fair to them it lacks science okay so besides the point it lacks science it can be anti-science all right so then this is easily debunked there's no other way around it so notice right here that notice all this fancy schmancy quantum cosmo cosmological deep calculations and arguments they all bend its knee to a creator an, an intelligent mind cannot be separated a large macroscopic object cannot be separated or a person you cannot separate uh, what else a beginning point you can't uh, separate that it all bends to the will of the creator that's a huge victory to creationists now let's uh, I will finish finally this whole scientific lesson you know uh, I have like I can make 20 more lessons on this it's just so much interesting stuff but I had to summarize it all here because I don't think it would be a good idea to go 10 lessons on this okay so let me finish it off with this last statement on this teaching okay now that what they're going to accuse you is you're just inserting God in there that's just a lazy way to do it if you're a real scientist you're gonna find scientific explanations for it so ah see he, he, he doesn't have to have PhD in physics he already had his common sense debunking that argument all right that argument is called God of the gaps argument all right God of the gaps argument is because there's a gap uh, of knowledge here no explanation you just put God in there no fool people with common sense already found out that if when you put scientific explanations there there has to be what a transcendent intelligent mind in there a transcendent intelligent mind how else are you going to get around that one that's scientifically proven in our uniform everyday experience with empiricism how do we do that remember the inference to the best explanation in the inference to the best explanation we take scenarios from our uniform everyday experience and then we try to find explanations to how it happened and then we came up with the best answer is what transcendent intelligent mind and that's all and that's what that is scientific I didn't say God I didn't say the Christian God I said a transcendent intelligent mind how did it end up with the Christian God because when you keep going on and on with inference to the best explanation we saw pantheism deism panspermia and all that and when we weighed it to the inference to the best explanation in our last discipleship class it ended up with our version of God all right now you could probably say we'll have to debate about a Catholic God Muslim God or a Christ, uh, Christian God or the one God but that's a t totally different argument right there all right but nevertheless it points out one God that created the whole universe by intelligent design like that without the process of billions of years of evolution to create humankind no he created man like that all right that was proven by inference to the best explanation another thing is this is that when they insist we need to find scientific explanations because that's what scientists do fool you already did that yeah. when you did that you know what science does when you're studying science it's supposed to help you predict correctly if you insist materials is what created us every time you use the scientific method your prediction failed but if your prediction succeeds then your theory is correct transcendent intelligent mind does that work absolutely when they came up with DNA the only way they could ex uh, explain it is and the D Wheeler DeWitt equation and everything else in our universe that's fine-tuned it is a transcendent intelligent mind okay and by the way those scientists wouldn't say that to you if they weren't intelligent enough themselves to come up with those scientific explanations for you 
So all the time, uniform everyday experience. The last thing is this. They'll say, if you argue God, if you specially argue for the Christian God, then there's no science. You get rid of science. No, from our first lesson of this teaching, I showed you that if you believe every part in our universe is created by God, it makes you study science more. Why? You want to know the intricate details of the artist, which can explain his personality, his workings, his preferences, his design. Man, that's fascinating, amen? It should make you more of a scientist, not anti-science. You debunk everything out there now, all right? So this deep, uh, advanced discipleship teaching should debunk any argument and all arguments out there, philosophical and, and empirical, scientific, atheist, I don't care what not, all right? This should debunk all arguments out there. And notice, this is done all with just one branch of philosophy, not all the other branches, empirical science. If you argue for God ontologically, if you argue for the existence of God rationally, and if you argue for the existence, uh, if you argue for the Christian God biblically, etc., experientially, spiritually, or whatever, then you totally crush then atheism evolution. This is all done only through one branch, empirical science. All right, so don't tell, so science is their God. That's the God of this world. You can now use their God against them. Their God bows to the will of our God. Father God, I pray that today's teaching was a blessing to the hearers. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.